I don't know where it fits with all of those. I just know that when WWE goes to one of these places now, they get out of the domestic United States and go overseas. They have some rowdy, rowdy crowds. Now, I'm very interested to see what happens when they go back to Scotland, considering that uh, Drew McIntyre and Piper Niven, but especially Drew McIntyre, uh, took a big fat L. But we'll get to that. The show opened with the I Quit match. Uh, The universal title match between Cody Rhodes and AJ Styles. And it ended up being the longest match on the show. Went about a half hour in the ring. And probably with all the pre- and post-match stuff, it was probably closer to about 45 minutes or so. Excuse me. Let's be honest here, too. As good as the segments were with AJ Styles two weeks ago, where he tricked everyone into believing, including Cody, that he was retiring, and the back and forth on SmackDown they had this week was it was cool, but this match absolutely did not need a I quit stipulation attached to it. It had one, it happened, and there you go. They immediately were on the outside of the ring. And back in the backstage area, they brawled around there. They brawled back out again. Mama Rhodes was right there at ringside. And we saw Styles' jaw with her before we cut back to a shot where Cody was bleeding because Styles had run him into the ring bell. And there we go. There's been another change into how WWE has done things here. We've seen blood a couple of times now with Cody. I don't know if everybody's going to be able to do it or not, but Cody certainly is going to be able to. At some point, or at one point, Styles actually pilmanized Cody's neck, and I'll be that old dude who joins the number of voices that throw their two cents in on that one. Don't do it. Don't do that spot unless it's for an injury, because even though we've seen it a bunch of times on different body parts, even now in 2024, It is an impressive visual that looks like it really hurts you. So just save it for injury angles. Styles kept getting the heat for a little while longer. He broke out kendo sticks and a belt to whip Cody with. Then Styles put Cody in an STF and Cody passed out. And yes, I will complain about this one as well. He passed out cold. Styles started to celebrate, but the referee told him no because Cody is not awake He can't quit. So AJ Styles had to take this man who was unconscious, who was rendered unable to speak, had to splash water on him and wake him up, which really didn't make any sense with what he did next, which was grab handcuffs. He could have taken the handcuffs, put them on an unconscious guy, then woke him up, but no, that didn't happen. He wakes him up first, then puts the handcuffs on him, then starts beating him again with the kendo stick, beating him with a chair. Eventually, Cody ends up hulking back up. He found the handcuff key, makes his comeback, hits several crossroads, including one onto a steel chair. He then cuffs AJ to the ropes, threatens him with ring steps, and Styles finally quit like a, a big old coward. Cody went and hit him with the ring steps anyway. After the match, Solo, Sokoa, Tama Tonga, and Tonga Loa attack Rhodes in the aisle, which led to Randy Orton and Kevin Owens running down to even the sides and everyone brawled to the back. So very likely getting a six-man tag team match between those groups, which is a perfect time to once again give the bloodline the numbers advantage because at some point during that match, you can have Hikaleo, or as he is now known, Taula Tonga, at least to me, or if you're Brian, Taula Tonga, to end up making his debut. It it would only make sense. We'll see what they end up doing. Then it was time for the women's tag team title match between Alba Fire and Isla Dawn against Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark and the champions Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair. Three women were in the ring at one time, and you can only tag your own partner to, to get them into the match. Didn't matter, though. There were a lot of times where everybody was in there. Jade slammed Shayna down, but Isla German suplexed Jade and stole the pin to win the titles. So much talk online about Jade slip up on the springboard, and I really don't know why. Actually, I do know why, but really, other than it's what people do, I mean... 
She recovered quickly, and whether it was Shayna whispering in her ear or she instinctively knew to start throwing punches immediately, that's what she did. I think people were being way too nerdy about it, but, you know, say the the, the whole... Same comes with the, the closing stretch complaints, and Brian was one of those guys who, you know, I, I would disagree with when it came to how much of a cluster F that the closing stretch was. I don't think it was as messy to the average fan as it was to a more eagle-eyed observer. Was it perfect? No. But I don't think most of the fans really cared. And at the very least, I think the negative response is way too disproportionate to how good I thought the whole thing really came off when you really look at the fact that Jade is so limited. And Isla Dawn has not been in the mix, especially on a big stage like that. And Zoe Stark is still relatively inexperienced in getting out there and doing things. So I honestly thought the 12 or 15 minutes, whatever this match went, I thought it, you know, again, I didn't have the highest of expectations, but it could have come out a lot worse. I thought everybody at the end of the day did a really good job. And I think they made the right decision putting the title on Isla Dawn and, and Kaylee Ray. Even if it was not, you know, they talk after the you know words of, you know, Paul Levesque saying, well, we didn't do this for sympathy because uh, Alba Fire's mother had passed away and all that stuff. We did it to do it. You should have done it anyway. I mean, honestly, it's a way you can get the titles off of Bianca and Jade without hurting them at all. They look super strong during the entire match. So I'm all for that. After that, the Intercontinental title match with Sami Zayn against Chad Gable. I thought this was a great match. Sure, there was a whole lot of of interference and outside stuff, but that was part of the story. And there was not a whole lot of interference. It was just a whole lot of staring outside and a whole lot of Otis and Maxine being out there and what was going to happen with them. I mean, this is, it's been a great feud. And Gunther and Sammy into to Gunther and Sammy and, and Chad and now Chad and Sammy. I mean, this is what the Intercontinental title is about. This is what all of us olds wax poetic about when we talk about Magnificent Morocco and Ricky Steamboat and Mr. Perfect and all that sort of stuff. I mean, Jeff Jarrett. Okay, maybe people don't wax poetic about Jeff Jarrett. I like Jeff Jarrett. I like Jeff Jarrett as an Intercontinental champion, but this has been the type of feud that is perfect for the Intercontinental title. And this hasn't been mentioned, and I know it's not a big deal, and maybe I've been missing it over the last couple of weeks, but Chad Gable actually had the Olympic rings on the back of his gear, and the reason I bring that up was because that used to be a big no-no. I believe by way of the United States Olympic Committee, they were the ones who shut down Kurt Angle using the iconography, the the rings, the medals. They didn't allow him to use the Olympic slam. They changed that to the Angle slam, but... That doesn't matter. What matters is Sammy's great. Chad Gable has been spectacular in his role now for months and months. No wasted movements, no wasted facial expressions either. And he was such a perfect jerk throughout this whole match. A wicked, wicked half and half suplex where Chad Gable landed right on his head. And I'm sure... He's landed on his head like that a zillion times in the amateurs and in pro wrestling training. But it was one of those things where he's fine, but it's one of those things that you can put on a highlight reel and say, hey, hey, you know, don't do this unless you're trained because that's going to break your neck. We got the spot where Gable wanted Alpha Academy to cheat on his behalf, but they don't. Uh, Chad draped Sammy over the ropes, wanted Maxine to hit him with the title belt, but of course she couldn't. Gable then went outside to take her to task when Otis jumped in between them, which the crowd popped huge for. Sammy then dove to the outside, but Gable pulled Otis in the way. A little bit later on, also outside, as Maxine was checking on Otis and his back was turned, Otis was, uh, Gable had an ankle lock or uh, on Sammy, and he had held the ankle lock on him a couple times on the outside. That was one of the big parts of the match was Sammy, you know, considering his finishing move is the Huluva kick, Chad Gable wanted to take that away from him, kept strapping on the, uh, the, the ankle lock. They were on the outside. At one point, Sammy reverses the ankle lock, which sends Chad into the back of Maxine's already injured leg. She falls over. Chad's kneeling there. Otis is kneeling there. They get up. They look at each other. You think Otis is about to kill Chad Gable, who bails himself back in the ring. Ultimately, 
Otis goes over, doesn't kill anyone. He thinks about killing Sammy, doesn't do it. He instead picks Maxine up, starts to carry her to the back. Chad is absolutely disgusted. As he stares them down, he turns around, eats a halluva kick from Sami Zayn, gets the victory. Pure sports entertainment here at the ending with all the great wrestling that went on, but I thought it worked out great. I really did. Afterwards, as upset as Chad Gable was, just staring holes through any everybody, just did not blink, just staring down Sami Zayn. Zayn looked at him, waved his hands, and said, that's it, we're done. We'll find out tonight if they're really done or not. Women's title, Bailey against Piper Niven. Bailey is Bret Hart. Anytime you go to Europe, Bailey is going to be the most popular person there, bar none, even in a country where they are facing one of their, their native daughters in Piper Niven. Bailey still got cheered. Not like Piper Niven got booed or anything. Match went about 15 minutes or so. Chelsea Green was thrown out by Charles Robinson, but ended up coming back a little bit later on with a Rey Mysterio mask on. Someone referred to her as Chelsea Verde. It kind of made me laugh. For whatever reason, when she came back, Robinson let her stay. Bailey went to the outside, threw her around, and then she wasn't a factor again. Bailey ended up hitting the crucifix driver a little bit later on, which got the pin. Big ovation for Niven at the end, too. And then it was time for Damian Priest retaining the world heavyweight title over Scotland's own Drew McIntyre in about 20 minutes. Drew got screwed at last uh, year's Clash at the Castle, got screwed by CM Punk at WrestleMania after he won the title. He was inducted into the Scottish Wrestling Hall of Fame. His wife was undergoing emergency surgery. It just seemed like everything was lining up for Drew McIntyre to get the victory here. That did not happen. Damian Priest won. Two big guys, just two guys with experience beating the hell out of each other. Damian Priest, as everyone knows probably by this point, went for a springboard, springboard dive. His right leg got caught in the ropes and he became entangled in the process. Priest almost really, he spiked himself on the ring apron, although it could have been a lot, lot worse. With the, the, he could have broken his neck, honestly, for a few seconds. He was just hanging up there upside down by his knee. Ultimately, long story short, CM Punk comes out. Once again, after a ref bump, ref bump screws Drew McIntyre. <laughs> Drew McIntyre, once again, takes the L at home. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Welcome back to the show. Mike Sempervivi here to put a bow on this thing. As I was saying right before the break, Damian Priest defeated Drew McIntyre in Scotland with help from CM Punk. If you have been hiding under a rock all weekend long and did not know what went down, they teased a ref bump and then delivered one. McIntyre shook off a choke slam and hit the Claymore kick. He made the cover. The fans started to count. They made it up to... I think around six and then they really started speeding up to get to 10 they were probably doing that because they saw a body run down wearing a referee shirt referee slid into the ring and the way the camera angle was you didn't see who it was you just knew that they had supposedly air jordan number ones on air jordan number ones the red and black ones chicago bulls colors yes it was CM Punk who counted one, two, and then held up and just smiled and looked at Drew McIntyre as Drew was about to kill him. In fact, he went to kill him, grabbed him by the throat, pushed him into the corner, and Punk kicked him right in the cojones. Priest ended up hitting south of heaven, and that was that. On social media, they showed a video where CM Punk was watching the match, sees the ref bump, grabs one of the referee's shirts, and then sprinted out to screw McIntyre. So we had a reason for it happening. But, uh, you know, I've long thought that Damian Priest turning babyface and Drew McIntyre leading the Judgment Day would be the way to go. But the more this keeps going, because he always speaks the truth, and because he keeps getting screwed, I don't know. It's a flip of the coin, and yes, there were people in Scotland that were cheering for CM Punk doing what he did, and I'm sure I'll have a lot of people here in the States cheering too, but I wonder if that worm starts to turn and CM Punk and doesn't end up being the most hated guy on the Raw roster when summer is all over with. We gotta see. 
Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that notify button and you'll never miss a video again.